Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a very bold claim. Uh, and um, uh, also on tonight is Helen Ashby uh, and her husband, Adrian. And Helen um, is, is one of my partners in crime in, in, in dealing with this museum. But this is, without a shadow of a doubt, the best rowing museum in Africa. And, and as a former director of the NRM, uh, I'm pretty well placed to make that bold claim. And the reason is not just the stock uh, and the quite amazing uh, collection we've got, it's what they do with it. And that is the critically important thing. It does not sit there gathering dust. It's a major, major educational, uh, educational and, and social venue. So if I can get this blasted thing to work, hold on. Bear with me, folks. Okay, and um, where is Sierra Leone? Well, Sierra Leone is um, on the uh, western uh, side of Africa, sandwiched between uh, Guinea and Liberia, both former um, French colonies. And here's little Sierra Leone just there. Um, that's a, a, a sort of general view. Uh, it's about the size of Wales and some sort of geographical points to note. First of all is the main um, Freetown area. This peninsula here is one of only two locations in Africa where mountains actually rise up from the sea. And Freetown, of course, is the capital uh, and is a major, major uh, trading uh, port and, uh, and location. Bo is uh, the second uh, major city. Bo is to is the Birmingham uh, as Freetown is a London. Uh, McKenney, Cambia, Kabala and Kenema are also reasonably major uh, facilities in their own right. Now Sierra Leone um, has been under British control, or was under British control, from the um, early 19th century. Uh, and it was an area that um, saw significant slave trading. Uh, there's a, a place called Bunce Island, which was where uh, slaves were corralled before being shipped across the Atlantic. And then with the uh, abolition of slavery in, in Britain, uh, under the aegis of William Wilberforce, more of him in a moment. Um, Freetown, Bunce Island then became a Royal Navy base for stopping uh, slavery uh, and intercepting slave ships. But Freetown has um, one of, a major natural harbour and it has always been a major trading location. Uh, during the Empire days it was a coaling station uh, and um, a little known fact but during the Falklands War uh, in 1982, uh, Freetown Harbour was a major uh, transit location uh, for our ships going down uh, to the South Atlantic. And a very grateful Mrs Thatcher, uh, after that war, um, sent significant amount of aid uh, to Sierra Leone, including the Royal Engineers to rebuild bridges. Um, it, it was obviously a, a key location uh, in the uh, Empire days. And in fact, in the Second World War, it played a major role as an anti-U-boat uh, uh, station uh, with uh, flying boats and, and so on. Now, it's, a, it's built very much along British colonial lines. This is almost like Surrey in a jungle setting. And if you could see that street today, Gloucester Street, it is utterly transformed. Uh, mainly as a result of the chaos of the most recent rebel war. And um, you go from that sylvan setting to this. Um, this is typical of the shanties that have, have grown up in Sierra Leone, in Freetown in particular. And the reason for this is that Freetown is significantly, grotesquely overpopulated. During the rebel war in which uh, the rebels came from Liberia heading east to west, uh, committing the most horrendous atrocities, and this is in the uh, 90s and very early 2000s, um, people fell back onto Freetown. 
And after the war, significant numbers of people didn't leave Freetown. And a city which fundamentally has an infrastructure that can cope with three and a half, 350,000 has got a population now in excess of 2 million. And this is a real, real challenge. There are two real religions, um, Christianity uh, and Islam. And if you could bottle the, the religious harmony uh, in that country and sell it, you would make a fortune because religion is, is never an issue. Um, religion pays no part in any internal strife in the country. But the unifying religion is undoubtedly football. And this is the Shaka Stevens uh, Stadium. Now, I was driving down Kissy Road, and of course, that's called a poda poda, um, like a sort of a taxi. And you'll see this everywhere. And you'll see the look at the white minibus on the right. Well, um, I stopped uh, to allow that to come out, and you couldn't make it up. That was a Manchester City supporters bus. And my thoughts were have these people not suffered enough? Um, some great, um, great um, commercial opportunities. Um, out there if you are so inclined. So um, there are three railway systems that we're interested in. Um, the first one was the, the national system. This, this is one our museum is focused on. Uh, opened in stages from 1897 and closed formally in 74, but continued running trains so long as there was track in seven, till 75. The mountain railway was quite short lived and this was never made money. It was designed to get the um, European workers from the malarial belt at the coastal level up to their houses in the cool mountain area. It was about five miles long, ruling gradient of one in 25, so it's quite steep. Um, addition worked. And um, it never made a penny, but it was a condition of service, a term of service that that railway was provided. And when a road was built up uh, the mountain, um, it closed. And then the final one, which we'll touch on briefly, is an iron ore uh, railway, developed from 1933, but reopened and extended significantly in 2012. Uh, and that system, literally this week, has reopened. So let's have a quick look at some of those systems. Right, first of all, um, the colour code here, the little purple spur there, that was the mountain railway. The railway in black was the main line. And there was a major junction here at Bowyer and a branch line went up to McKenney. This is about 320, 330 route miles of two foot six, which is a pretty extensive system at, at that gauge. The light blue here is the original stretch of the three foot six gauge iron ore railway. And the red is the extension that was built in about a dozen years ago to exploit brand newly discovered um, iron ore reserves here in a place called Tonkilili. And um, the view is that there's enough, you could, you could weigh, the weight of all the reserves here would equal the weight of the Isle of Wight. There's, there's an interesting fact for you. So very briefly, look at the mountain railway. Um, this, as I said before, was designed to uh, get Europeans up into the hills, about five miles. Interestingly, the big tree in the background is called the cotton tree, and it is effectively the national emblem of Sierra Leone. It's still there now. And where that train is, is uh, now uh, Shaka Stevens Street. The building um, was the station, but is now part of the National Museum. Um, love the little line, but uh, just look very carefully at the next shot because the next photograph was taken a year ago from roughly that spot looking towards us. And um, I'm sure you'll agree <laughs> that the contrast is utterly stark. I'll just go back <laughs> and that's it uh, today. Uh, that railway, as I say, was quite short-lived 
Um, we'll now look very briefly at the iron ore railway. Um, the Sierra Leone Development Company, which is a British concern, had discovered the iron ore deposits, uh, built a 50 mile railway from a port at Pepel. Um, and um, it was all Garrett worked initially. Um, <clears throat> the sort of Birmingham uh, Sulza diesels were brought in, which oper operated in uh, multiple. And these photographs are taken from some publicity material uh, from the day. And now this is the 80 mile extension. Um, now I just want to sort of give you some facts and figures. It, an 80 mile extension um, was planned and built through virgin territory in three years flat. Now just apply that <laughs> to the uh, length of time it takes to get anything done from a railway perspective in this country and I think you'll be impressed. That's, my view is that I don't think actually there was much of a planning process. They just decided where the railway was going to go and it went. So let's have a quick look at the national system now, which is um, what our museum in Freetown is centered on. Um, built, paid for, I mean, they've been planning for about 20 years to have a railway, but it was the um, merchants, the, the, the Chamber of Commerce in Liverpool uh, stumped up the money uh, to pay for the railway. And this obviously was designed to um, get gain access to the, uh, natural resources of Sierra Leone, huge amounts of palm oil, um, kernel. There was, a, there were, it was a, a major uh, asset, but it was built to two foot six gauge in order to keep the price down. And as a consequence, uh, they minimized on civil engineering, but they couldn't avoid having to build umpteen sinuous bridges uh, and uh, as a consequence, the line was very windy, very steep. And although the maximum speed of most of the engines was about 25, the average speed for the timetable was somewhere between 10, 12 and 15 miles an hour maximum. And to get from Freetown to Pendembo at the far end of the line, which is about 200 miles, involved an overnight stay in Bow. It was so slow. So here's some images of the of the stock. Um, you'll get a sense, I hope, that uh, this museum, when we get to it, is as much a museum of British colonial railway exports as it is a museum of the transport system of Sierra Leone. Uh, this is the only uh, Manning Wardle two foot six gauge 040 saddle tank called Nelly. Um, this was the work shunter at Kleintown. And that engine is actually in our museum collection. You'll see that later. The ubiquitous Honslet 262 tank proliferated and in fact lasted from 1897 with the design, mod design modifications that meant that, it was, that the design was still being built in 1954. The last one, number 85, wasn't built until 1954, but they're chunky little things and they've got a serious uh, power uh, to weight ratio. Garrett's transformed the railway. This was the early series of Garrett's in the 1930s, but the key ones were these amazing machines built from 1955 by Bayer Garrett, 14 of them. The boiler barrel is five foot wide on a two foot six gauge track. And when one stands in front of this and looks along it, and we've got one of these, you think, why the hell does it not wobble over? but these have got the power classification of a black five on two foot six gauge track. And these completely and utterly revolutionized the railway. Dieselization was a 1950s thing. Um, these are, this is a Hudswell Clark Enterprise diesel uh, delivered from in 1959. And there was a, a, a major series of these. We've got, we've got two of these uh, in the collection. I just wish this railway had survived because it would have been the most extraordinary tourist attraction this day. That is the so-called Oregu viaduct. It's the tightest curved viaduct in the world. It was their version of the fourth bridge. It featured uh, on postage stamps. And during one of our visits a few years ago, we discovered that it was being stolen. Just, just 
pause for a second there and dwell on that. It was being stolen before our very eyes. Uh, Indian scrap merchants um, and the locals were cutting it up um, and the police didn't interfere with it. Uh, and it's just utterly heartbreaking. Uh, this is uh, Bo, which is um, in uh, roughly halfway across the country. And as I say, this is the second city. And um, if you go to Sierra Leone now, the fashions uh, have not really changed. These photographs were taken in the, in the late 50s uh, and um, wonderful colour shots. And just as we were about to give independence to the country in 1961, uh, the UK made major investment in the country, including in the railway. And one of the projects was to cut a corner. The railway had to go um, round all the way around this sort of valley and the Brits decided they would build a viaduct straight across here and you look at that lot on all that bamboo um, scaffolding bringing concrete by hand I mean the the health and safety people in this country would have a field day with that but it was built this was the launching of the bridge and this was the opening of the bridge um, and here is the British governor, uh, and um, here is the future prime minister of Sierra Leone, Sir Milton Margai. And this was them after the ceremony leaving, and that was the governor's coach, which subsequently after independence was put in service as the president's coach. And you will see that one later as well. In 75, um, the Welshman Columbia Railway went on a visit to try and buy some coaches. Um, that scene is now a dual carriageway. But while they were there, they looked around to see what they could find in addition to coaches. And the um, discovery uh, of um, that, uh, that garret, <clears throat> and that has fortunately survived, but in particular, number 85, which they'd on the spot decided to buy. And it was shipped back to the UK with the coaches they purchased and a lot of additional material. And uh, that engine has worked very well. It's very suited to the Welsh Pool line. And of course, um, we are currently looking at how we can get it restored to traffic. So <clears throat> the railway was lost and um, it was a decision forced on the government really by the World Bank. But there's no doubt there was a significant amount of corruption associated with the closure of the railway. And you saw those piles of rails earlier. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, people made a lot of money privately out of uh, scrap metal. But if you go up country, there are still the remains of the railway. Uh, the bridges tend to have been converted into road bridges. Um, the station signs survive um, everywhere. This is Bowyer Junction. This is effectively... Uh, the crew of, um, uh, of um, uh, Sierra Leone. And the, if you know where to look, you can spot where the railway was. This was Nichols Bridge. This is in the, this is about a mile from the town centre in Freetown. Uh, and that is the same scene today. Um, quite sobering. Uh, and you'll start to understand why <clears throat> I'm beginning to make labor this point that there isn't really poverty as these people know it in this country. So what, what was I doing there? Um, I'm on the right, by the way, in case you haven't worked out yet. Um, I was the uh, full colonel deputy commander of IMAT uh, and the advisor to the president on reinstating the Ministry of Defence as an organ of state rather than as a threat to the state. And this is up in Bo. Uh, so I was on secondment to the Sierra Leone military. So the cap badge I'm wearing there is Sierra Leone military, as is the, the rank badge. Um, most of my time was Freetown base, but clearly went up country quite a bit. That's uh, Songo Station. But um, I'm a railway enthusiast and um, wherever I have gone around the world, I've always researched, you know, just what might be uh, out there. Uh, for me to look at and I was in the I was going to the foreign office in London about a week before deploying um had an hour to spare uh looked into the window of a book called uh, 
transport bookshop called Motor Books in the Strand. And that book was just being put into the window. I kid you not. I thought, cracky, I'll have that. So I bought that. And um, that that allowed me in short order to work out what the lie of the land, as it were. Anyway, on the um, I got there on a Thursday. On a Saturday morning, I then went with um, uh, a chum of mine from who was already out there. And I said, let's get down to this Klein Town, this factory, and have a look what's there. Um, We'd worked together in the past and he knew my predilection for railways. And we came across um, the former engine works at Kleintown uh, to find this. So that's chunks of Garrett tank. Those are Garrett cylinders. And um, I went to see this Chinese gentleman because there's Chinese everywhere. And um, he said to me, have you come to take the trains away? And I said, what trains? So he took me down to a building and appeared in and appeared in off the left hand side and this looking through the windows and this is this is actually taken the day after on a sunday this is what i found and i nearly i nearly fell off this pile of sleepers i'd created in order to look in because i could see through the gloom a garret so and in fact the window i looked through originally was that one and there in front of me there's a garret but it was a complete and utter mess and so this was the first Saturday. Uh, this is what I found and um, quite a challenge. Um, one of the problems had been that there were 10,000 displaced re refugees in the railway workshops. And um, um, I, I was amazed that so much actually had survived, although most of the brass and copper had gone, obviously. So this is what we uh, came across. There's a very nice Hudswell diesel. You can see Nelly in the background. Grand, we saw Nelly in a photograph earlier, and um, it was pretty forlorn. <clears throat> and um, I then um, said, Cracky, who, uh, who, who's looking after this? And they gave me the name of a guy called Mohammed Bangura, who was the last general manager of the works. Because after the railway closed, they didn't shut the factory, they kept it as a sort of major, as a heavy engineering workshops. And uh, so I rang him up on his mobile and we met on the Sunday when these photographs were taken. he had a key to get in and he was so apologetic he'd done everything he could to try and protect this stuff and he was quite crestfallen and um you know I, I said crikey you know given what's happened around here I'm amazed that you've managed to keep so much but there's a you know there's a very good chance actually that we could do something with this um that, folks, was built for the state visit of the Queen in 1961. Uh, and um, although the Africans couldn't see beyond the chaos, I, I had this sort of view that we had to do something. Anyway, I was having a dinner on the Sunday night, and um, uh, that's the governor's coach you saw earlier in the shots. And... Um, I was talking with, uh, with a chum and I was going in to see the president of Sierra Leone the next day and um, for my first meeting with him. And at the end of that meeting, um, I said, can I raise something else with you, sir? And uh, his staff looked aghast because there's nothing on the agenda. And he said, um, what, what, what do you want, Colonel Davis? And I said, well, there's a serious danger, sir, that you are going to lose what's left of your railway heritage. And all of a sudden, President Cava just sort of lit up and he said, tell me more. So I explained what was going on and what I discovered. And um, he just out of the blue said, right, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, you be there. I'm going to bring the whole of my cabinet, a film crew of the Chinese. You do all the talking. Um, that van, by the way, was ankle deep in the paper records uh, of, of the railway. So this is uh, the Tuesday morning. Um, that's the present cover in the grey. Um, I handed him um, my only copy of the book I'd bought in London for him to just have a quick flick through, but he just walked off with it. So I could hardly say, oi, give it back. Um, Mohammed Bangura is on the right. Um, clearly I'm the one dressed like a tree. Uh, and um, the Chinese gentleman here was um, Mr. Mu, who was utterly transfix as to why the president had come down. Very pleased. Now, bear in mind, I've arrived on Thursday. So four days later, I'm hosting the president in their own factory. So we um, 
we had a look around and um, and I showed them and I explained what could happen. And um, I then realized that what we had to do was to get the Chinese to agree that although they had been leased the whole factory, the building that the railway stuff was in ought to come back to the government. So I saw my moment and I waved over the TV crew. And that evening, by the way, there was a one hour documentary on Sierra Leone television about this. And um, I got Mr. Moo into the shot and I got the president into the shot. And I said, and this is very important. You just listen to these words carefully. Um, the, um, and the interpreter for Mr. Moo, he didn't speak English, was stood there as well. And I said, Mr. Moo, you don't need this building, do you? So the interpreter did his piece and Mr. Moo shook his head vigorously, at which point the president cheered, applauded, shook his hand. And I turned to the TV camera and said, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Moo has just handed the building back to the Sierra Leone government. We can now look at what we can do with the, with the railway stuff. So everyone dispersed, very happy. I ain't got a clue what I was going to do, but about half an hour later, I saw the um, interpreter begin what the army is called an interview without coffee. And what it turns out was that I had said to the Chinese guy, um, you don't need this building, do you? But the interpreter had said to him, can they have this building? Which is why he shook his head. <laughs> and uh, and but it was too late. Anyway. That had some repercussions because, as we all know, the Chinese don't like to lose face. And they um, they tried to trip me up a few times um, over the coming months as we got going. But um, anyway, so um, I go back to the Ministry of Defence <clears throat> that night. I'm at a cocktail party on, on HMS Southampton with most of the cabinet me members who were present at the works that day. And, and the, they said, Colonel, we've had a great day. The president was so happy but nothing's going to happen, is it? And I said, Minister, you bet it's going to happen. Watch me. Anyway, they gave me a key of my own, and um, that was a bureaucratic process uh, in its own right. And uh, on the following Saturday, and of course, I'm on unaccompanied posting. I've no family to worry about. Seven days a week, I can do what I like, really. And uh, so I came into the museum on Saturday, open the gates and in the in the gloom and darkness and the silence of that building on my own I looked at it and I and the enormity of what I'd taken on just hit me um but then a, a voice behind said so what are you gonna who are you what are you doing and I said who are you and he said I'm Ibrahim Kayati sir and I said well I'm Colonel Davis and I'm going to turn this into a railway museum that Sierra Leone could be proud of and he then posed the immortal question what is a railway what is a museum I thought Crikey, <laughs> we're starting from a very low base here. Anyway, I managed to get this guy to go off and, uh, and I realised that um, we, the government hadn't got two brass farthings to run to rub together. And these guys were not row enthusiasts who do it as volunteers. I thought, right, well, I'll be investing my own money in my hobby in UK, so uh, I need to open up the checkbook. So he went off and we recruited this team and um, yeah, and I paid them. And we got going. And in fact, a number of those guys in that shot are still with the museum team now. So we got going. Um, I have to confess uh, that quite a bit of military resource was put into this because um, we had accounts with various hardware stores. And the quartermaster would say, what do you need, sir? And I'd tell him. And then we would start uh, talking to um, businessmen. And when businessmen could see that this was not a one shot wonder and it was actually working, then they would put money in and so on. So the first job was to clean and clean and clean and clean. And it went on and on. These pits, which were absolutely full of garbage, um, you know, we emptied those. But it was like an archaeological dig because every time somebody found something, they'd shout out. So we found a whole load of gold leaf lettering for coach uh, numbering, um, found a driver's cap badge, found a firing shovel, all this stuff, and, and some of which we kept. There was still even sand inside the uh, sandboxes on the steam engines, and there was still coal in the coal boxes on top of the Honslet. So cleaning was the order of the day, and um, 
uh, I'm a hands-on guy and um, and it certainly helps keep the weight down, I can tell you. Um, but um, you have to get stuck in with these guys. But it was it was really, really good. <clears throat> really enjoyed it. But we then got to the point where we decided we needed, I wanted to paint something just so the guys could see a bit of progress. So we started off with that, um, uh, with the Hunslet. <clears throat> and um, anyway, we came in on a Sunday, a Saturday and all good to go and painted it and it was absolutely immaculate. And we came in on a Sunday and it was like a bottom of a parrot's cage. And um, overnight, this wind called the Hamatan, which comes in from the Sahara, brought with it a few tons of sand. And we didn't have a pane of glass in this building at the time. And so the thing had to be uh, scraped off and started all over again. But at that point, I determined that we would have to weatherproof this building. So we managed to raise a bit of money and that entire building was reglazed for less than £1,000 um, using local labour. It was an extraordinary uh, thing. So we got better. Um, it was interesting exercise in, in human relations. I didn't know any of these guys to start with. Um, and one had to very, work with them very closely to work out what they were good at. Um, he was brilliant at painting, but he wanted to do something else. And another guy who didn't want to paint wanted to do something else. And I'd say, no, 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 come on chaps, let's stick to what you were good at. This is Umaru who was grade A at lining, it turned out, uh, putting the lining on, on the garret. So I, I kept him on the paint job. Here we are. <laughs> Never smiled, this guy. <laughs> Never smiled. So you can see things are starting to come on. <clears throat> and um, Phoenix-like. Uh, but, but I thought, right, well, look, we can't leave the Queen's coach looking uh, as bad as it was. So although it was originally... I mean, it would have been plied to start with, with steel sheeting over it. We clearly didn't have any steel sheeting. And fortunately, Mohammed Bangura had been involved in the construction of the coach in the uh, early 60s. Uh, and so he gave us some guidance about how to restore it. And just to give you a feel for where we were and where we got to. Uh, this coach was so far gone, um, I got permission from the president to scrap it. But what we did was we took um, uh, the wood from that coach and used it to um, complete this one. The far one is an, what's called an officer's saloon. And that was the outcome. Um, I've never done this before, but um, managing people and a project didn't seem that difficult i mean what you do is you haven't got the skills you go and look for them and you and, and um but it looks jolly nice i think you'll agree that was the governor's coach um getting a, a good lick of paint <clears throat> looking rather nice and um a guy who is now one of our honorary patrons out there the managing director of sierra construction systems uh, amazing guy called kamal nasa who we're heavily involved with his company um, made all the new windows for us. So here's some uh, shots of, of, of where we're going to, and, and you'll recall those grim scenes right at the very beginning. And of course, in between all this, I'm running the Ministry of Defence. So um, there wasn't much time for, for, the, for the beaches and the, and the other places of, of Freetown at the time. It's quite an exhausting year in some respects. Uh, these two guys are still with us. On the left is Mohammed Jabi, who is now the senior uh, tour guide. And on the right is Santigi, um, laziest African uh, on the planet. Um, and, and, but he's one of these guys who quickly learned that if, he was, if I saw him walking around with a brush, it, I assumed he was on his way to do a job. And then I twigged that he was carrying the brush in order to avoid being given any work. <laughs> So things are coming on very nicely and um, we've had some fun. We've had our own photo charters. Um, it's amazing what a few burning rags in the, in the smoke boxes will do. Um, we reached a point where I thought, I mean, the public outside is saying, what the hell's going on out there? And um, the gates would open, the boys would come in, the gates would show, and at the end of the day, they'd come out. So I had a chat with the uh, president about an open day, um, but what I didn't realize was that this actually turned into the opening 
even though we hadn't finished all the stock. Um, so on the on on the fateful day, um, we um, we had a, a big uh, audience. This is the um, choir of the Milton Margai School for the Blind, who composed a piece of uh, railway music especially for the occasion and sang the uh, Sierra Leone and British national anthems in the most angelic way. And even now I can feel the lump <coughs> rising in my throat at the memory of that. Uh, you'll notice on the right, the uh, wall. Um, I referred earlier to the Chinese making our um, job a bit difficult. Well, I decided that we would, um, I wouldn't let the Chinese unfettered access uh, uh, to come and mess us around. So for two weeks, we assembled the materials to build the wall. And then we swung into action as it went dark one night. And by the time they realized what had happened the next morning, um, that wall was up. The locals dubbed it Colonel Davis's Great Wall of China um, because anything that one could get one up on the Chinese was good by then. Um, I don't think I'm being cultural offensive um, to make uh, uh, the uh, observation that the Chinese leadership techniques lead something to desire and the African is not naturally motivated by Chinese motivational techniques so they didn't get on particularly well. So this was the opening and um, here in the shadows here is Andrew Scott who was then the director of the National Royal Museum in York and I managed to get a gentleman called Rajiv Bendre who was the head of the British Council uh, to pay for Andrew to come out if I could talk him into it because I felt that Andrew's presence would um, uh, help to internationalize the project and that, and that certainly worked. So <clears throat> all those months before when I'd shown the president this I said to him jokingly I'm going to serve you tea in that coach one day and of course they all laughed and guess what we did. So these two ladies were at work for the British Army and we set up teas and cakes and everything, put chintz chairs in there and um, we had the Foreign Secretary, the President, the British Am High Commissioner, the American Ambassador, and a few others. Um, and it was by invitation only, because there's not a lot of room in a, in a coach that big. <laughs> but we had a lot of people trying to gate crash. And so we got over that by handing over the spare sandwiches and cakes off the edge of the balcony there. So this was the day uh, President did what all politicians do. Well, they, uh, lots of um, um, speeches, there's Andrew making a speech, Andrew talking to a driver who that guy tried to accost the president. He had been um, uh, sent to court for manslaughter when his train derailed and they claimed he was speeding uh, and he was acquitted when it realized that people were traveling on the buffers between two coaches and a suitcases fell onto the track and derailed the train. Uh, but he, he'd been quite embittered about that. So here was our great, um, it was a great day and decided to do sort of military fashion. Um, we had a, 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 a photograph, couldn't, uh, couldn't get rid of this guy on the right. He was one of the um, bodyguard for the president and he just wouldn't shift. So we opened up to the uh, public and um, after the president had gone and it was mayhem. We're talking hundreds, if not thousands, just pouring in. So that was that. Um, we then uh, we then developed. Uh, I came back to UK and um, to be chief of staff of a division in uh, Edinburgh. But eventually, as you're probably aware, I went on to run Mosey and then the NRM. And I'd already looked at how we could maintain links with um, the um, uh, museums. And this morphed into our charity, which is the Friends of the Sierra Leone National Rome Museum. Um, we deal directly with the ministry. Um, this, the Monuments and Relics Commission is their version of DCMS, and this is one of our visits. We've had umpteen projects with them. We had a £20,000 project uh, paid for by the British Library to digitise all of the records, and, this, and we turned one of the coaches into a dark room. Um, this is Tim Dunn, who you've been seeing on the telly uh, a lot, and Tim was with us in, in the early days. And in fact, Tim uh, created the corporate uh, stuff for us. So when you see all these badges uh, and all this, Tim's, Tim's produced all that for us. 
Um, we raise money. Most of the money we use directly on um, uh, materials and so on. Uh, but when we go out there and we never send the money, we always take it with us. Um, we will pay stipends for additional work. And uh, there aren't many rowing museums in, the, in Britain where work pauses for a second while everybody uh, has a coconut. And maintaining the stock in a climate like Sierra Leone is never ending. Um, but we always try to enhance, and you'll see those replica blast plates that Nelly had lost the plates, but Michael Whitehouse, um, who runs vintage trains in, in Tisley, very kindly paid for those replicas uh, to be fitted. And that was Nelly. She originally was sat on the concrete floor, but we managed using jacks and wooden blocks with lads wearing flip flops, for goodness sake, uh, to jack it up and get it onto a piece of track for display purposes. The educational program is a massive success. And um, there is hardly a day goes by without an educational visit. And this is the key thing I was telling you about, about why this is such a fantastic museum, because it doesn't just talk about the technical side of railways. The, rail the museum is used as a vehicle, excuse the pun, for explaining the social history uh, of, the, uh, of the country. So here we've got lots of um, uh, shots of happy kids. Um, look at the paint scheme in the museum. That's comparatively recent. Um, they've gone for a sort of great Western Railway uh, station colour. And actually, it's a lot better, I think, than the stark white that we originally had. Much of this material has been brought in containers from the UK. Uh, in many respects, thanks to our relationship with the Science Museum group. And the, and uh, I can't remember where we got this from, but Helen could remind me. But um, we stuffed that into a container once, and it, it it's um, it's um, very popular with the kids, as you can imagine, because there aren't many bouncy castles in Sierra Leone. And um, we laid a special piece of track, and so we've now got our own dedicated uh, pump trolley ride, and this is a big hit actually. Um, again, I'm sure it. it doesn't need regulating, you don't need rules on how to use it. And guess what, no one's been hurt, but it, it's great fun and it helps to bring the uh, degree of movement to the event. Um, that's the outside of the building. It's in a rough part of town and the roof was uh, leaking quite badly. Um, so we, government managed to um, find money to replace the roof, but ran out halfway through. Um, so a wealthy benefactor in the UK, to whom we are eternally grateful, uh, stumped up £10,000 to finish the job. And, um, and so £10,000 pays for one of those buildings. You wouldn't, you'd hardly cover a bungalow in this country for that price. Um, but these, this, the boys sent their uh, appreciation to our benefactor in the UK uh, with that lovely card. We have a program in the UK for training. Uh, and uh, as I said to you, we, are, uh, we have a formal link with the National Rail Museum and the Science Museum group. And this was us taking some of our guys. Uh, the guy in the suit is Mr. Nylander, uh, who is the museum director. And, and of course, you'll recognize Dame Mary Archer, who is the chair of the Science Museum group. And we're utterly uh, delighted with the with the support they have given and in fact the um, every time the NRM rebrands so does the Sierra Leone National Railway Museum because the, the 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 old uniforms get put into a container and we take them out and they are that's the NRM a lot of the NRM material being worn by our boys and um, for the Queen's birthday a couple of years ago um, the the guys made this um, uh, photograph in front of the Queen's coach sent it as a card or signed with a copy of this small book that we have. And Helen received uh, this response from the palace. I'd gone to the palace to see Andrew Ford, who's a personal chump, and he guaranteed that the queen would see the card. And, and so we got that back. And that's now on display in the coach. We have a friends organization in the UK, as I've explained, but we've also got a, what they call the friends chapter, the Freetown chapter, 
And this was the early days of, of setting it up. And these fine ladies, and you wouldn't cross these, I can tell you, um, they'll, they'll, they'll give you um, a good telling off if they have to, but they're absolutely priceless. And of course, the, what I'm delighted with is the volunteering ethos that this museum has created, because volunteering is a not, it, it's a fundamentally a British thing, I think. Um, I know that's a sort of arrogant thing to say, but it's not necessarily an African thing. Um, uh, and uh, but the fact that people volunteer, I'm very impressed with. And this was, I think, on this occasion, these were some of the new um, Freetown chapter people explaining what they thought um, they should be doing uh, and so on. We, when we go out there, we have regular uh, bits of fun. Uh, and this was actually getting ready for uh, the Christmas party. And um, I played Santa. So this is a two Christmases ago. The museum's also a social space. Uh, and um, this was, um, it became a distribution point for sanitary products for ladies uh, from a, a UK charity. And on this occasion, uh, the museum was used as a workshop venue for the um, educating people on the evils of female genital mutilation, which I'm sorry to say is still ongoing in Sierra Leone, but inroads into that barbaric practice are being made. And, and we're delighted to play our part. Um, I mean, the reality is that this museum is one of the biggest social spaces <laughs> In the whole of Freetown, and um, and the, and it should be used. And I do love to see um, this going on with a steam engine in the background. We've imported many of the practices that, that we are all familiar with in the UK. So you know, amongst the staff, in terms of motivational techniques, and these staff are all paid. By the way, I mean we've got a ten strong paid staff, and that's a major commitment. My museum. This is this is Abdul, recently married. Um, who was employee of the year, and he was one of those guys who was with me from day one. And there's Mohammed, <clears throat> and um, sadly Mohammed is no longer with us. Um, that was a, his home. He stood on a bit of boilerplate there, which he obviously purloined as a mini bridge. Um, but after he died, the boys decided they wanted to have a, a, a statue to him, and the statue. This was the unveiling of the statue, and the, his family are in the front row there. And it was a, an emotional occasion. He was my biggest, best chum in Africa. He was absolutely, I just loved him to bits. He was a great fan of the A4s and this was him on a course at the NRM. So what we did, uh, surmounting this hideous statue that they had made, um, we uh, had made in this country, a solid brass nameplate with his name on in the style of an A4 nameplate. And uh, I think you, I hope you'll agree, that's um, quite impressive. It took, a, it took a bit of manhandling to get that into the container. Um, we, a year ago, literally, uh, March of last year was the 15th anniversary, and we were out there, uh, a large group of us from the Friends, and we had just um, pulled £10,000 together to pay for the drilling of a water supply for the museum. It was the biggest gap in, in the arsenal because we were having to bucket water in and the water supply in that part of Freetown is, is pretty weak and pathetic. But the museum now has its own um, uh, water supply uh, and all of a sudden so much of the dust problems we had have now gone away because we can just hose things down um, and, and it, it's impossible to overstate the, may, the impact that water supply, a regular water supply has had on this museum. Um, <clears throat> when we had our team come out, um, we, we, we um, did a, a fairly major uh, tour of, of what remains. And this is a photograph from a few years ago. And some of you remember Anthony Kills. Anthony Kills is one of our number with Mohammed at Wilberforce Railway Station. Sadly, and this was from the 19, um, uh, this is from the Mountain Railway which uh, of course uh, was closed in 1929. Yet the station survived, including the ticket window with the ticket prices still on display. And, um, but then the government or rather the Freetown City Council decided to knock it down without any reference to anybody. Um, anyway, this is, this is literally a year ago. Um, this is our uh, visit team. And we just, 
we put some money into a bit of a restoration of the Wilberforce start site. Not surprising this part of Sierra Leone and Freetown is named after William Wilberforce, that's the connection. Uh, and these two lads um, um, were with us from the very start. Um, uh, Umru's on the right, you've already met Abdul on the left. Now we have extended our reach. Um, now we, 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 we haven't finished, we'll never finish in Freetown, but the opportunity arose to try and bring a railway heritage focus elsewhere. And that, uh, that uh, became Bowie Junction, uh, which is there. And note um, that it was 62 miles by rail from Freetown, but we had to travel 130 miles by circuitous road to get there. And that's a great advert for the efficiency of railways. So this was a major adoption by the government of Bowyer. The remains of Bowyer uh, Junction has been designated a protected uh, national heritage site. And money was invested to have the place cleared up. This was pretty overgrown. This is the only railway subway in the whole country. And um, the infrastructure that remains is extraordinary. So water column on the left is a coaling stage. The signs are there. And, uh, but before starting on the ceremonies for the day, we went to see the Paramount Chief. This guy here discharged himself from hospital simply to be here for this event. And, um, uh, but here, this gentleman here is the Honourable Deputy uh, Minister for Culture. And this guy has become an absolute powerhouse, driving force promoting the Railway Museum in a way that I've not seen before. And um, so long as he is in that job, um, I think many of us in UK sleep e more easily in our beds. So this was the event uh, literally one year ago. Um, speeches galore. Um, there's the there's the devil, uh, and the um, this 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 was the line of the railway, by the way. So there's the coaling stage, and the railway went in that direction to Freetown. And the locals uh, formed a. Uh, a, a, a heritage club in Bowyer and um, what we want to do is to get re-engaged with Bowyer as fast as we possibly can when we're allowed to go back out there because I'm concerned that I don't want momentum to be lost at this location. Um, what we do is, is widely appreciated and the British High Commissioner uh, who's on the left there, Simon Mustard, hosted a, a wonderful cocktail party for us and um, then we had the main event in the museum. So everything had to be spruced up. Everyone came from near and far, speeches galore, and the opportunity was taken to twin the Welsh and Clumbar Railway with the museum. And on the left is Steve Clues, who represented uh, the Welsh and Clumbar. And they uh, repatriated that plate, which they had taken in 1975. So it's a great place. It's an amazing place. Um, on our last day, virtually, I was in a cafe called Crown Bakery and this guy walked in and I'd often told Helen about this fella. This guy used to sell me eggs um, when I was in the army. I bought eggs off him even if I didn't need them. Um, and you'll notice that he has no hands and um, both chopped off by the rebels during the war. Um, his right hand had been um, um, adapted so he could actually use it as a sort of like a pair of pliers really um devout christian um bigger smile on his face he had nothing to be smart to smile about but he did and um it was an emotional end to our tour just to accidentally bump into this guy um here's this uh powerhouse of a team this is memonatu pratt who is the minister uh, miss robertson who is the deputy minister uh, Mr. Nylander, uh, Helen, of course, and her uh, uh, husband, uh, Adrian. Now, I'm putting this back up because I think this is quite a profound, as we come towards the end of the presentation, uh, profound stark contrast. If you look at that red star at the top of the shot uh, and then look at the red star on the next shot, it's the one and same location. And that was at the height of the rebel war. These were the refugees that were occupying the railway compound. 
And I hope if, if nothing gives you a sense of what has been achieved, um, then just take away those two images. And finally, um, that describes the UK approach to railway enthusiasm. Well, this is what you get if you join us working uh, in Sierra Leone. This is number two beach. This is where they filmed the Bounty, A Taste of Paradise advert. Oh, and let's have a lobster for a spot of lunch. So come on, you know you wanna do it, get stuck in. This is the route to and from the airport, the most spectacular uh, way of, of arriving and departing. And the airport is just beyond those palm trees. Ladies and gentlemen, that is concludes my presentation. Um, we, if you, I know that everyone's desperate for your money, but if you are so inclined to make a donation to what we do, I make the obvious point that we have no overheads whatsoever, and every penny goes into, and your pet and your money does go a hell of a long way. Um, you know, um, five pounds can make a big difference. Five pounds will buy us five tins of paint. So if you want to, you can find us. We, we have a, a friend's website. Um, but that concludes my presentation. I'll now stop the sharing. And um, I think back to Connor to uh, take over control again.